The world can tell where God is. Sometimes the church can't tell. I see things that I won't go into now that make me weep. Friends of mine, acquaintances of mine. I don't know the motivation, but I see things that are flesh. I see things that are not God. And they're saying it's going to win people for Jesus. And the world can walk into a place like this. Hear a message like Marty preached the other day. A strong message and say, this is the type of preaching our country needs. The children of this world are wiser than the children of light. And the Philistines looked at Isaac and they knew there was something different about him. There was something more than just the fact that he had a lot of herds, a lot of flocks, a lot of servants, a lot of crops. They knew there was something different about him and they weren't ready to deal with it. And so they sent him out. You say, how are we in the same place? If we're not there, we'll soon be there. Because as soon as Isaac reaches the valley that he chose to reside in, he is immediately confronted with a huge dilemma. And that dilemma is not a secondary thing. It's not a matter of preference or likes or dislikes. He wasn't looking for the most pristine location to set his tent up. He found a place, it was ample room, and he thought this would be a good place. He wasn't worried if they had wireless internet access. He wasn't concerned if it was a good place for his ministry to operate. How many big donors live within 10 miles? That was not his concern. He had a concern much more basic and much more essential than that, which we as a church need to have as well. And that was the essential matter of life. For without water, no matter how many herds he had, no matter how many flocks he had, no matter how many tireless, devoted servants he had, even his own family, without water, there would be no life. Folks, we need water. We need the life of God's Spirit among us. Not just during five days of wonderful, God-moving crusade services. We need water in every service. We need water when we wake up. We need water when you face that boss that troubles you. You need water when you're in the hospital room. You need water when your loved ones break your heart. You need water when you go to bed at night. You need water when you try and minister to somebody. Without water. We have no life. Something as basic as that. And it seems like today, if we're not careful and if we're honest, we as Christians don't even see or realize the state that we're in. We think we just need to make some corrections over here. We'll try the program this way next time. We'll advertise with this demographic group next time. We'll increase the budget this way. We'll bring so-and-so in, and that will get our people excited. We'll find out what the secular world is interested in, and we'll craft our sermon series to mirror those television shows. That's what we need to fulfill our mission so much of our brothers and our sisters, maybe even you, think. But we need to come to the painful realization that none of that stuff matters. Some of it's outright reprehensible, but not even the things about budget and proper practical things that every church needs to take care of. Not even those things, even if they're done with a reverence for God. None of it matters if God isn't there. None of it matters if the life of God isn't there. We need water. Lest we dry up. Lest we have a form of godliness, as the Apostle Paul said, yet denying the power thereof, the power that would change our lives. So Isaac was in a place where something 
had to be done. It was truly dig or die. Folks, I, we have enough dear people. Some are very faithful. I say we, I mean the church at large. God knows where His people are. But it's time we stop worrying about our soft hands. Time we started to dig. That's what Isaac did. Now let's talk about what he didn't do first. Let's talk about what he didn't do. He's faced with something. If he doesn't find an answer fast, you can live without a lot of things. You can live without a new suit. You can live without a new dress. You can live without going to that restaurant you like so much. You might even be able to live without that girlfriend or boyfriend. Young people, you might be able to. Might. Not sure you're convinced. But you can't live without the presence of God. You can't live without a fresh touch upon your soul. You can't live without living by the fountain that never shall run dry. You can't live without what that little Samaritan woman found out when Jesus told her in John 4, 13 and 14, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again, I guarantee it. But if you drink of the water that I shall give you, give you the gift of God as eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans six twenty three. If you drink of the water that I shall give you, it shall be in you a well of water, a spring, a fountain of water, springing up unto everlasting life. We need that living reality of Almighty God for all of our activities are nothing if the life of God is not there. Dig or die. Now, What Isaac did not do, he did not go to the Philistines and try and find out where's the best water supply. We're doing that today. We're doing that. What do people need? What do they want? We go into neighborhoods and instead of trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we give them a survey. Tell us why you don't like church. Tell us what you'd like in a church. I'm not joking, this stuff, this stuff ha- has happened in literally thousands of regions. It's advocated by the top church growth experts. These are not incidental people, people off to the side with no voice. One of them has between 16 and 18,000 member churches. It's not a denomination, but it's a movement that has taken the church like a tidal wave. Go into the neighborhood, don't. Don't go up and start talking about the gospel. You might turn them off, then they'll never come to your church. You wouldn't want that. No, instead, ask them a bunch of questions. Find out what they would and wouldn't like in a church. And then, craft a service or a weekend program that they would like. Some of you think, You're making that up. I'm not making it up. That is how most of church in the evangelical world, or I think most is not an exaggeration. I would have to say at least, I'll let the Lord figure out the percentage. A preponderance of church in the Western world gets their marching orders from surveys. Isaac didn't do that. He said, the times are far too serious. I've got to look at the faces of my servants and their families. I've got to look into the eyes of my own family. I've got to look at these animals that God created to be a help to me. We need water. So he didn't go to the experts. He grabbed some shovels. Praise God, he grabbed some shovels. We need some shovels in the church. Amen? We need some shovels back in the hands of the army of God. And then what he did was he remembered there were some wells around here years before that his father Abraham had dug. Abraham Abraham traveled a lot. He didn't didn't stay in one little place like his son Isaac would, one little geographic region within 40, 50, 60 miles or whatever. Abraham was a sojourner. He was looking for a city, the 11th chapter of Hebrews says, whose builder and maker is God. And Abraham, wherever he went, 
God gave him leading and wisdom, and he had the resolute nature to obey, and he dug wells. 